Baptist Church, and it shouldn't be that way, as I'm going to preach out the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you'll turn with me there, we'll look at what the Bible said. It shouldn't be that way because it's in the Bible. But immediately when a Baptist preacher says preach on the gifts of the Spirit, some of these Baptist brethren raise eyebrows and say, oh no. Um, he's done went off the deep end. Uh, you, ain't, you ain't went off the deep end to believe the Bible. That's right. You ain't went off the deep end to believe the Bible. And uh, now tonight I know I'm not going to satisfy the crowd that uh, majors in the gifts of the Spirit. They're not going to like at all what I'm going to say. Uh, but I'm going to try to uh, bring you a message on it. Now, it would take several weeks to study and preach or teach this thing out the way it should be handled. But I want to just name them off tonight, show you a little bit about the gifts of the Spirit and how I believe that God through the Bible administers them. And you hear a lot of talk these about exercising your gift. You hear that? That's a big term nowadays. People say it in churches, oh, you got this gift, that gift, exercise your gift. Normally when people are talking about exercising your gifts, they're only talking about one gift and you know which one that is. About 95% of the time, you hear them on television and radio saying, you need to learn to exercise your gift. Do you know what gift they're talking about? And they ignore the other gifts. Now, it's a very simple outline. If you want to outline the gifts of the Spirit, there's three parts to it. Now, the, I'm going to give them to you at the beginning and then put them under these categories. Now, I'm going to try to teach you some tonight, but also preach. It's kind of a double uh, message tonight, so you want to hear some teaching, also some preaching. The, the gifts of the Spirit are divided up in three groups. Group number one, the sign gifts. Group number two, speaking gifts. Group number three, serving gifts. And I believe if you look in the Bible, you'll find that all of those gifts of the Spirit fall under one of those three categories. Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now that right there would solve most people's problem. they just obey that verse. Boy, we got some of the most ignorant teaching on the gifts of the Spirit that we've ever, ever had. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. And it's not as bad around here as it is in most places. You ought to go down around in parts of South Carolina and part up in Michigan. You talk about ignorant teaching. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant. You know that ye were past Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Did you hear what I said? Yes, the Lord. You got a bunch of people running around today saying, you confess that Jesus is Lord? Yes, Jesus is Lord. Woo! Hallelujah, you're saved. No, hallelujah, you ain't saved. It don't say if you confess Jesus is Lord, you're saved. It said that no man can't confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. You're confessing His deity, except by the Holy Ghost. A man can't even believe that without the Holy Ghost. That's right. No man can do that. Look at verse number 4. Now, there are diversities. That means different, divers, different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. See, a bunch of different gifts, only one Spirit. And there are different... Differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Here we go, verse 8. For to one is given this, by the Spirit the word of wisdom. There's a gift. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith. By the same Spirit. You say, well, preacher, I thought every Christian had faith. Every Christian has saving faith. This is a gift of faith. See? Special faith to do certain things. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. 
to another, divers, different, that means different, kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self-same Spirit dividing every man severally as he will. That's the Holy Ghost's job. Now look at verse 28. <clears throat> and God hath set some in the church. First, apostles. Second, verily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, after preaching and teaching, miracles, gifts of healing, and here's one that some that wasn't mentioned over on the other list, helps, governments, and diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? Of course not. Are all workers of miracles? Of course not. Have all the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? If you go to some churches, they do. Do all interpret? Of course not. But covet earnestly the best gifts. Boy, there's an unusual thought. Some of them's better than others. I didn't, that's what he said. And yet I show unto you a more excellent way. I want to preach to you first of all this evening about the sign gifts. There are three gifts of the Spirit here who are, who fall under the heading of what we call in the Bible sign gifts. Now, for you that already know this, bear with me for a minute. There's a lot of people in here that don't know this. So please, be patient with me as we go into some things that are simple to you, but might be helpful to some young Christian here tonight. Turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me show you something. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it gives you a very interesting verse here. In verse number 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 22 tells this. said, the Jews require a sign. Jews require a sign. Now hold your place there just a second. Jews require a sign. Did you know it began with the history of the Jewish nation? They required a sign in order to believe God. Back yonder at Moses' day at the bush, when God spoke to Moses at the burning bush, God spoke to him and He said, Moses, go tell my people and preach to Pharaoh and get my people out of there. Moses said, Lord, they're not going to believe me. And, Moses, and the Lord said, all right, Moses. He said, I want you to stick your hand in your bosom. He stuck it in here, pulled it out, and it was leprous. Put it back in, come out, it was clean. He threw his rod down, and the Lord said this. The Lord said, if they won't believe the first sign, and they won't believe the second sign, He told him that those things were given, those miracles there, were given as a sign to the Jewish people. Now, the Bible said here in 1 Corinthians 1, 22, Jews require a sign. Jews require sign. To make, to make this brief as possible, so we can get into the rest of them, the, the, when Jesus Christ came to this world, He came to His own, and His own received Him not. He came to the Jewish people. He told one of the disciples one time, He said, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the Lord knew that Jews require sign. He came to His own, His own received Him not. So the Lord said, all right, I'm going to give you a sign. Did you know the nail prince was a sign to unbelieving Thomas? The resurrection was a sign to fight by Jonah being in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. And then when the Lord goes back to heaven, the Holy Ghost comes down on the day of Pentecost. They did not have the New Testament. They had no New Testament Scriptures. And the only way that those Jews would have known that God really raised Christ from the dead and that it was really true was that God give them a sign. The Jews require a sign. They said, we're not going to believe He really rose from the dead until you show us a sign. 1 Corinthians 14. Take your Bible. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, everybody get settled down here. We got, this morning there was really, really too much getting up and moving around, especially by a lot of young kids. So do not get up. Any more kids, do not get up, okay? A little bit too much this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 22. Wherefore, 
tongues are for a sign. You see that? Jews require a sign to believe, and God gave speaking in tongues as a gift on the day of Pentecost to Jews that did not believe. Look at it. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Listen, tongues was given by God, the gift of speaking in tongues, not to prove to somebody else that you were spiritual. God did not give the gift of tongues with a whole crowd of people sitting in a room speaking the same language as English or whatever. God gave the gift of tongues as a sign to Jews who would not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. There are only three times when people spoke in tongues in the Bible. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter, I believe it's uh, 19, is that right? 11 or 19? Believe, oh, well, I believe it's 19. I'm not positive. But it's 2, 10, and 19, or 11, 1. And did you know all three of those times it was to uh, show an unbelieving Jew that God had really raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now listen, there is not one bit of need in the world and all of us coming in here tonight speaking all the same language and then us speaking in tongues. There is no use for that. There is no call for that. Paul said in the church, I'd rather speak ten or five words that people could understand than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. I'm not trying to be mean or ugly. I'm trying to teach you what the Bible says about that, that gift. It is a sign gift. It it was given to unbelieving Jews that rejected their Messiah. The one time that Gentiles spoke in tongues in the Bible was to convince unbelieving Jews that God had accepted them. The first two times, He was to convince the unbelieving Jew that God raised Jesus from the dead. The third time at the house of Cornelius, was it 19? And Acts chapter 19 was to show unbelieving Jews that God had now poured out His Spirit on the Gentiles. That first gift tongues there was a gift of a sign to Israel. Now, I'm going to say something this, this evening. And I imagine in this many people, we're going to have somebody in here that's going to be maybe offended or take this wrong. But you listen to this. Old gray-headed preacher tonight. That's what the holy mother guys say. Uh, you, you listen. You listen to this. Old preacher tonight. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something that you need to hear. Real good. I've been in any, about any kind of service you can think of except for the handle snakes. And I, I, but I probably went to one of the night after I got saved and probably t tried it if God hadn't had mercy on me and kept me away. I probably would have. But uh, just, uh, but I mean, I went through all of that stuff. I went through the whole ordeal. I've seen them boil like Oh, oh, Ernest Angley and, and that crowd boy got that high slick back way down here and pull out a comb during the service and come around and go, hey, I guess, you know, knock somebody upside the head. If you ever seen Ernest Angley, you know, buddy, there's something weird about that dude. He just, oh, friends, it's so good to see you. Oh, friends, I just, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord have mercy. That ain't the Holy Ghost makes a man act like that. That look like he's gone. I mean, uh, that guy acts strange. They got the weirdest looking. Uh, have you ever seen Robert Tilton, you know? God is going to send you whatever you need if you'll send me five dollars. Now, listen, the Holy Ghost don't make you act like that. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be ugly. Good night, folks. You ain't supposed to act like that. I mean, he said, listen, if a guy had all... Here, can't you figure this out? Here's a man got all this faith. And he, he spends... He's got a 30-minute program. He spends 15 minutes telling you that if you'll just believe, you can have anything you want, and then spends 15 minutes begging you to send him money. Does that make any sense to you? That's crazy. He, he, he says, all you got to do is believe it. God will send it in. He'll supply you need. And then waste 15 minutes saying, I've got to have your help. We need hear from you. This week, we're, we're, we, we just believe that God has touched many of your hearts to plant a seed in this, in this, in this ministry. And I heard one on the radio not long ago talking to money. He was talking to money. Honest he was. He said, money, I know you're out there and I command you, come in. Can't you imagine that dime jumping up and rolling down there and going down there? Lord, hell. There ain't no, I don't know of anywhere in the Bible where you talk to money and command money. 
Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I command the bookstore to be paid for. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just believe, believe. That's a bunch of junk. That is a bunch of junk, people. You say, I don't think you ought to make fun of not. Listen, somebody's sincere. I don't make fun of them. If they disagree with me, I don't find them on it. I know a lot of people who, who, who really believe they've got the gift of tongues and they're sincere and they love the Lord. I'm not trying to be... I don't criticize them as a person, but I've been in those meetings and I want to tell you something. I want to make a statement. Now, I want to make this statement. If God is giving Gentiles, and I don't doubt God can do it, God can do anything. That's not the issue. The issue is not... The a lot of times they'll criticize and say, Oh, them Baptists believe God can't do it no more. I don't know if a Baptist believes God can't do it. The issue is not, can He do it? The issue is, does He do it? That's the issue. Does He do it? And a lot of these... There's no doubt if there was a Chinese man walked in here tonight... And boy, he walked over here. I said, I said, how's it going, bud? He goes... You know, he's one of these doctors. He ain't learned how to, you know, he's like this. He wanted to, hi, I doctor, cut you some. I can't, I can't. He, they don't even have to bend over to get you, man. They're so short. They're, they just slice you up like that. They said, who was it? Who was Jim's talking about it at lunch today? Oh, he's talking about McDowell High. They ain't winning no ball games or nothing. Said they going to get him a Chinese coach called... Doc, Mr. Win One Soon. <laughs> but I, I tell you what, brother, I, if he come in here tonight, and, and, and I believe, I believe, if that man come up here tonight, he said, and he, we knew he's wanting to get saved, I don't doubt that God, he could take hold of any of these boys right here, he could take hold of their tongue, and they could tell him how to get saved in Chinese. I believe that. I believe that could happen, don't you? God could do that. But, as far as a bunch of people getting in here and all of us speaking, uh, we all know English. Let me ask you one question. I'm going to make this statement. I was getting ready to make a minute ago. If, if the churches who claim to have the gift of speaking in tongues as they had it in the Apostle A, tell me why in the world do all of their missionaries have to go to school to learn the language of the place where they're going to go preach. Where do they have to go? They have language schools where they have to go run uh, Chinese or French or, or whatever language. What, what's the big deal, man? If, if you just come to Alder and get it, skip the language school. Can you, I can't imagine a guy getting up and saying, God's called me to be a missionary to Romania. And I'm going, hallelujah, 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 and then I'm going to school to learn Romanian language. You mean God's going to give you another language just to blab around in church and not give you the language of the preaching to? That is absolute proof. That is proof. And you'll never hear one. It's like Oral Roberts building a hospital. And Catherine Kuhlman went and died in a Baptist hospital. I mean, I'll tell you, all this, all this uh, healing power. And listen, brother, I may be in the hospital tomorrow. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm some great man of faith. But I'm just saying, I mean, that stuff begins. It's, it's like all healers. Have you ever, every healer you ever seen in your life wears glasses? I ain't never seen a healer that didn't wear glasses. Have you? Every single one of them. Where's all that faith, big boy? You can heal cancer. And all this. Why don't you just go think and get 20-20 vision? Name it, claim it, brother. Get it, grab it. Command those eyes to get better. You say, you better shut up. You're, 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 I'm, I ain't much myself, but I'll tell you one thing. Whoso boasts of self of a false gift is like a cloud coming over and promising and don't give no rain. And brother, that's what you got today. We're always saying, boy, God's going to send revival. God's going to send revival. I believe revival's coming. He's getting ready to pour out His Spirit. And what you've got is a bunch of people saying, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And it don't never happen. There are three gifts that are what we call sign gifts. Tongues, healing, and miracles and those three listen what I'm getting ready to say those three gifts faded out when the apostles ministry changed from Jew to Gentile I did not say God can't heal now I did not say God don't heal now I said the gifts to healing and miracles 
faded from when the Jews were, were rejected the gospel and the apostles said, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. The Jews require a sign. Gentiles believe by faith. And the sign gifts were to Israel. And if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, you show me one service where somebody raises dead people and I'll get back up here and apologize and we'll let them come in here and preach to us how to do it. Show me one person. You say, well, I know, praise God, somebody went to the altar and they prayed and they got healed. I don't argue with that. I believe that. If you're sick here tonight, you come up here, we'll anoint you with all and pray for you, just like the Bible said. But listen, if anybody heals you, it'll have to be God that does it, not me. I'm not a healer. I have no power to heal. God can. God does. You say, well, I believe that so-and-so's got that gift. Okay, in the days of the apostles, they could walk by, one of them could at least, and his shadow could get on a sick man and he'd get well. You know anybody can do that? I challenge you to show me anybody in this generation that their shadow going by a sick bed can make a sick person get up and walk. I challenge you to show me anybody that a healer has ever healed with AIDS. I challenge you to show me anybody that's ever been raised from the dead. Now, I'm not talking about Grandma that saw heaven and Papa and came back. She wasn't ever dead or she'd have stayed there. <laughs> That's right. Don't get mad at me, brother. You don't go to heaven on vacation and come back and tell everybody. If you did tell you heaven, you can't come back and tell everybody. God wouldn't let Paul come back and tell about it. He said, keep your life. God may have given Grandma a glimpse over in this promised land or something and see a vision or have a dream of Papa. But if Grandma's ever dead, and, they, and I mean the plug pulled and that brain quits, and she enters in the pearly gate, she's there to stay. Amen? Amen. In this generation, you don't go to heaven on vacation. The sign gifts. Listen, I, I've never heard of anything. Listen, if those guys had the gift of healing, or the apostles had it, the last thing they'd ever have to do is take up an offering. I'm, I'm, I feel like some of you might be getting a little uh, rubbed the wrong way, but if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, you come down here tonight and show me what I'm wrong and then produce somebody that can walk over somebody and let the, you say, well, I know my sister got healed. Praise God. I'm not arguing with that. Lord's heal me. All healing really eventually comes from God. But I'm telling you, God does heal slow. God does heal instantaneously. But the sign gifts were to Israel. That's all I'm saying. Okay? Now, I've not got... Time we could go into a big long thing there tonight, but let's talk about the speaking gifts. Now the Bible talks about a word fitly spoken. The speaking gifts are knowledge, wisdom, prophecy, and teaching. Now, there, uh, preachers disagree on this, but personally, I find nothing in the Bible that does prohibit God from still giving all of these other gifts that I'm going to name God's people today. There were three of them that were signs to Jews. Tongues, healing, and miracle. It's not said that about any of these other gifts. I'm not going to argue with you about it. And we may have disagreement here. I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. There's, as far as I can see, there is nothing in the Bible that says God can't give any other one of these gifts, especially to individuals to work in the body of Christ. For example, knowledge and wisdom. Now, do you know what that is? Some people just have a gift of knowledge and wisdom. You ever, you've known people. Yeah. They're, they're just gifted. It's just like God has given them. Now, knowledge is just a bunch of stored up facts, but they, they can understand, reveal truth in the Word of God and have the ability to grasp it and put it all together. That's, that's a gift that God gives some people. You've been around people like that. Have you ever been around some people? I mean, sometimes it's a man, sometimes it's a woman. I've been around women that just sit around and talk about the Bible and what God done for them. And it's just amazing how they can just, just spit it out. And God, they start talking about all the Lord's done. And it, it's just like they're gifted to be able to put it all together and, and they have a, like the word of knowledge. I've been around a lot of men. And they're not always preachers either. Laymen. That just, I, we've had some in our church here. 
that boy, they just love to sit around and talk about the Word. And they've showed me things. And they'll say, now, here, Brother Danny, just sit over here and over here in Jeremiah 3 and back here in Song of Solomon and just tie that thing all together and show you something that'll just blow your mind. It's almost like they have a, a knack, like an uncanny ability to fit Scriptures together that normally don't have. That be the gift of being able to grasp truth and putting it together. Wisdom would be like... Count. Have you ever known anybody that seemed like just had the gift of wisdom? You ever known anybody that just had the ability to give you the right advice and everybody, they just kind of had a reputation of, well, I can go to this person and they'll tell me what I should do through a knowledge of the Scriptures. Sometimes it's a pastor, sometimes it's a deacon, sometimes it's a lay person. They just, uh, they just, they just can tell you what to do. And it's amazing how some of them, sometimes you'll have somebody on a, on a, a board something like that and they'll just sit there and listen to this part and listen to this part, listen to this part, and they'll sit there real quiet and then they'll just speak up and say, what we ought to do is this and that and this. And everybody just be amazed. They'll think, man, how did you think of that? Just think of a solution to the problem. It's just like a gift of wisdom that God has given them. That's right. They can, they can just come up with a solution that absolutely blows everybody's mind. Then there is prophecy. That's also a speaking gift. I'm just hurrying through these because I'm going to get down to another one and I'm not going to take long tonight. Now there's also preachers are split right down the middle over what is the gift of prophecy. And I know I've read the commentaries. I've got all the views. And some of them say that, you know, actually in the New Testament, the Old Testament prophets were foretelling. The New Testament prophets were foretelling. You know, you've heard all that. Foretelling and foretelling. You'll hear a lot of well-known preachers, and I'm not trying trying to belittle them, you'll hear a lot of good, good preachers, maybe even some that come to our meetings, will get up and say the gift of prophecy in the New Testament actually means to foretell, not necessarily foretell. That sounds good, and they try to make prophecy just preaching, but the word prophecy don't mean that. The word itself, prophesy, proph don't just mean preaching. Sometimes when you preach, you are prophesying, but not always. It, it's congregational preaching that applies God's revelation and shows future events. The Bible said the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, if I know of a man, let me give you a man, for example. Clarence Larkin. Clarence Larkin lived in the about the 1900s, about the turn of the century. We've got some of his books over there in the new in the uh, in the bookstore over here. Now, listen. Did you know if I've ever heard of a man that had the gift of prophecy? That old boy had it. He told things. Listen. We got a lot of preachers preaching that Israel became a nation and the last generation and all that from 1948. And that's good. I believe that too. Hey, that old boy preached it in 1919. 30 years before it happened. Now there's a fellow with some unusual ability to take the Word of God. I do not believe that God gives anybody prophetic revelations. I can't find it in the Bible, I should say. And I try to base, base what I believe on the Bible because it really don't matter what I believe. I do, I do not find the Bible where God gives anybody prophetic revelations over above the Word of God that He's revealed right here. The difference between a New Testament prophet and Old Testament prophet, Old Testament prophets were seeing things that had never been said and never been wrote. New Testament prophets take the Scripture and predict the future and prophesy through the Scripture. And that's what old Brother Larkin did. He told about things that were amazing. Now, these guys come in and say, Praise God, I've got the gift of prophecy. And Vince, Vince, there's going to come, some, there's going to come something in your life this week. I can feel it, Vince. There's going to be an evil power come against you this week. And, I, and thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not give in to this evil power, O Vince, that thou shalt be faced with. This, that's the kind of prophesying they do in a lot of these churches around here. Right. What kind of prophecy is that? Who else ain't going to face an evil spirit this week? Man. And see the guy sitting there saying, they prophesied over me. I know a fellow that they prophesied over and said he'd never quit, do great and mighty things, pre and rose, raise people from dead and do all kinds of things. And that fellow right now is living like a devil. I mean, I mean, wicked as a devil, brother. And I can't even tell you all he's involved in. And they prophesied over him at church, and people believed the prophecy and said he's going to raise people from the dead and have a great healing ministry and everything else. If he is, he better get get on the ball. See. Sometimes you'll look, at, you'll look at somebody and you'll think, they're going through a hard time. And then you start thinking, God's telling you something. 
Now, we don't have it that bad around here. We do some, but not... I'm not talking about anybody having to give prophecy or anything, but sometimes you get people think, God's told me. God's told me you're going through a hard time, Brother Gene. Now, maybe he is. Who in here ain't going through a hard time? <laughs> Now I believe I believe that God burdens our hearts to pray for people. I'm not I'm not discouraged. Don't don't be afraid to say that. I believe that. Sometimes the Lord puts somebody on my heart to pray for. Sometimes but you gotta be careful. You gotta be extra careful of these people saying that God told me you better not trade cars this week, Brother Bobby. You look at him and say, He told you, why didn't he tell me? I had a woman tell me up on Main Street one time that I shouldn't be a pastor. God that I should be a I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. If there's anything else you could be, I'd be it. But I want to tell you what, brother. Listen, you don't, you got to watch that kind of stuff. But I can take the Word of God and prophesy here tonight. Watch. Three big wars is coming up in the future. Oh, Brother Ryman. He was at the meeting last night. Had a bunch of these kids from up in Delaware. Oh, I'll come, in, I'll, I'll come into the camp meeting, boy. We're going to have the wild maniacs, the Kentucky headhunters, the people from Delaware, Maryland. Able, they're all coming to the camp meeting. If we're not careful, we'll just get crowded right out of here and it'll be their camp meeting and we won't get to enjoy it. He's, he's coming to case. He went into one of his bosses. His ministry is just to shock people. He said he went into one of his bosses' place the other day and there's these guys in there talking. He said, yeah, well, boy, I'll tell you what, boys, three more big wars coming up in the future. Walked out. They said, hey, hey, what? Hey, hear that? Hey, how you know that? Where you get that? You get that from the Bible. There's going to be one war after the rapture when the Antichrist comes out in Revelation 6. There's going to be another war at the end of the tribulation in, in Revelation chapter number 16 called the Battle of Armageddon. Then there'll be the final showdown at the end of the millennium when the, when the devil gets off the chain gang that he's been on for a thousand years, comes out to make war against God, and fire comes down out of heaven and burns him and his armies up. Three big wars in the future. I just prophesied through the Word of God. I will tell you, Jesus is coming in the rapture. Prophecy. The, the Antichrist is coming to this world. Prophecy. But these prophecies are through the Word of God. But some people just have the knack. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to blow your mind, but in Acts 21 and verse 9, the Bible said Philip's daughter prophesied. A girl. You say, Brother Daddy! He's gone to Maryland and come back a compromiser. I didn't write the Bible, brother. The Bible said his daughter prophesied. Does your Bible say that? And you know, you know what Baptists they say, well, I don't grumble. It's the book, brother. It's the book. Now, the book that says Philip's daughter prophesies also said for women to keep quiet in church. You'll never hear a woman preacher get up and preach 1 Corinthians 14.35. I want to tell you, praise God! Slam her pocketbook down, stomp her high heels and say, Let your women keep silence in the church! You ain't going to hear them say that. You say, <laughs> Can't you see them slinging her pocket around, coming up, ripping her hose on the pulpit, and coming around? Oh, my soul. You say, Brother Danny, that just don't look right. The reason that don't look right is because it ain't right. You say, Well, how does Philip's daughter prophesy in the church? Right? What does the book say in 1 Timothy? The book says in 1 Timothy, I suffer not the woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in, in learning silence. For the woman was first to see, the Adam followed her. Listen, a woman can teach that book to little boys, little girls, and other women, and mother just prophesy all she wants to in the Word of God. That's what the book says. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, I know Baptists go off the deep end on the other way and say, I don't believe oh, God ever told a woman nothing. Listen, brother, God can tell a woman something just like He can a man, but there's a place for it. There's a place for it. God's not a male chauvinist, and I'm not either. I believe we're different. Anybody that believes men and women are equal is mighty, mighty dumb. I mean, they, they really need to go back and start in the first grade and come up through it again. If you think men and women are equal, son, you, you, you're in bad, pitiful shape. We are very, very different. Very different. Now listen, that's what women can do. Prophecy. But let me give you another right quick. I've not even got to what I was wanting to get to. These, these serving gifts, what I really want to preach on. Teaching. The gift of teaching. You've known people that just have a, the ability, that's a gift 
to teach. God has gifted some people to teach. Sometimes it's a woman, sometimes it's a man. They just got the ability. Now, teaching is a real gift. If you can take truth out of the Bible and convey that and get it in other people's mind and cause them to understand it, you've got a gift from God. You really do. And you ought to use that gift and, and let God use you. When I was studying this scene, I was thinking about people that had, I thought might have these gifts. And immediately, of course, Brother John Ollis comes to my mind. Anybody here knows Brother John definitely has a gift to be able to teach the Word of God. I've had a lot of people just here in the last couple of months. Somebody the other day, they was visiting here from, from uh, another state. And they told me after service, they said, Buddy, I can learn something from that man's teaching. They said, he's a smart Bible teacher. I said, he sure is. He's a good Bible teacher. Now, some people just have the ability to teach. And there's probably a lot of you folks in here. You say, oh, well, that must be what's wrong with me. I ain't got the gift. Don't think that. You may have it and just ain't working on it. God wants you to be every one of you Sunday school teachers. I'll tell you one thing, though. It is a sad thing. A lot of churches pick people in and put them, make Sunday school teachers out of them that have absolutely no ability to teach whatsoever. That's sad. And that goes on in a lot of churches just because he's a good old boy or she's a good old sister or because they're important in the church or something like that. We ought to have people who have the ability from God to teach. All right, let me talk about number three, the serving gifts. Number one was the sign gifts. Number two are the speaking gifts. Knowledge, wisdom, prophecy, and teaching. And finally, serving gifts. These are governments, discernments, faith, giving, or not necessarily giving per se. It goes under helps. Helps. Government. Now, the word government there means, of course, it means anywhere. It means you, the, you, got, you got a big wagon going down the hill and you say, you watch it and you watch it over there. And these people govern it. They keep it in line, keep it straight. Some people, like uh, 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 deacons and leaders and uh, rulers in churches and a lot of times in leadership, just have a gift to govern things. They have a gift. They have a knack. They, uh, they have, they, I don't know. Listen, God's done what He's done here in our church, not because of me, but in spite of me. I tell people that everywhere. I had two people asked me this morning in Washington, D.C., when I was up there this morning in the airport, two different ladies. One was sitting about two seats over. She asked me, first thing she said was, what scenario did you graduate from? I said, nine. And she I didn't say that. I, started, I, I said, I said, didn't go to one. She said, Oh, and another lady on the plane, she said, what seminary did you go to? I said, none. They asked me up there all week. They said, what seminary did you go to? I said, none. I, I got st saved when I was 18. I started preaching when I was 19. I've been doing it ever since. I'm not against going to school. Everybody ought to go to school if you get a chance. That's a great thing. But I'm just saying, listen, the gift got to come from God. The gift's got to come from God. God just has to be able to give you the ability to what He's called you to do. And He will. He will. Government. And then there's discernment. Now, discernment means that you've got the ability to sense truth from error. The Bible says, try the spirits, whether they have God. In all of the churches we've got nowadays, I seen a church up there the other day, some Holy Ghost apostolic Faith, Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ, baptized, Holy Fire, something or another, up there the other day, and it had a big sign out front, and it said, Revival service every night till Jesus comes. The preacher said, Look at that sign there. I said, They don't have service every night till Jesus comes? He said, Yeah. Well, I said, There's one thing for sure, brother. The Lord's coming soon. They're going to have a long revival one. He said, That sign's been up there two years. <laughs> They've been having services every night for two years. Now, I don't know if they've really been, I don't know how come kind of out they have. Every, every night, seven days a week for two years. But you know what, you know what caused somebody to do that? Some guy sitting around one day and he got more spiritual than he, than he really was. And he thought God told him that they'd have a big revival and then Jesus come. He thought he got wrapped up and exuberant in the flesh and thought the Lord coming back in four or five months or something and said, we're going to have service every night till Jesus comes and now he's a life in stock of town. That's where you've got to watch thinking God told you this and God told you that. God ain't going to tell you nothing that he done told you he wasn't going to tell you in the Bible. No man knows the day or the hour when Jesus is coming back. And that's where people get off. You've got to watch people that get... now. I want our church to have a balance. I want us to have plenty of emotion. Shout, praise God. Woo! But I want us to know what we're shouting about and have our doctrine straight and have some move. That's a hard way to keep a church. 
They'll go overboard on the Spirit or they'll go overboard on the truth. Some of them just sit there and say, Praise God, we got it all figured out. We are dispensationalists. We are this, we are that, you know. We got everything just right. Dead as four o'clock. Others just come in and jump the pews and knock the pulpit over and all that and don't know what A from Z in the Word of God. So you got to have both. All right, let me get you quickly. Faith. George Mueller, of course, ran an orphanage in England, never took up an offering, never asked nobody for help, and raised millions of dollars and supported kids. Read the Bible through 200 times, 100 on his knees, and got down and prayed, and sometimes the kids' plates would be empty. Kids would sit down, and there wouldn't be no food in the house. And he'd say, let's ask the blessing. And they'd say, what are we going to pray? There's no food in the house. He said, let's ask the blessing. They'd get down and say, Father, we thank you for this food. That's how close it comes sometimes. Before they got through, somebody knock on the door. Kids someday. You see a little example of that is Fred Potter and what goes on at Bristol, Tennessee. Lester Roloff. And people like that. Some of these people just, they have faith. We all have faith. They just have like a special faith. Boy, they can believe. Now, I don't mean to confuse. I don't mean you think, oh, well, I must not have it, so there's no... No, I don't, mean to, I don't want you to think that at all. It's just like some people have an, an amazing faith. If you'd read the Bible 200 times, 100 times on your knees, you'd have it too. And then there's helps. Helps. I got to think about that this evening. You never hear much about that on the radio and television. This is a neglected gift. Helps. Ew. I don't like the word of that. They make fun of me up because of the way I say, I say help. Come here and help me a minute. H-E-P. <laughs> Come here and help me move this thing. They say, well, you say help. I say, I reckon I do. I never thought about that, but in the Bible, it's help. H-E-L-P. Okay? That's what it is. That means some people say hope. But it's, if I can't move this pulpit, and I'm saying, mm, and you look over and say, poor old preacher, can't move the pulpit. And you run up here, and you help me do it, see? Some people just have a gift of help. Now, I believe that stopping our church, and I've been praying about this this week, and I'm going to make a few statements, and I'm going to close. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a little bit, well, I won't say worried. I'll say a little bit concerned openly. But it, that's, that's be about the way I should say it. I'm, we're having a little bit too much trouble getting help. We have a little bit too much trouble getting help in the bus ministry. It shouldn't be that way. We have too much trouble getting help for a work day. It shouldn't be that way. We have trouble getting help in nursery. It shouldn't be that way. This is something that everybody in here can do. And I, I hate to say this, and I don't, I'm not calling any names, but I believe there's a bunch of people in here just kind of sitting back saying, oh, well, the church is big enough now. we got all these new people just kind of let them do it. Just, I don't know, I'm just sitting here and stuff the blessings. So it might be that some of you tonight need to get down and say, God, how do you want me to help? And there's something that everybody in here can do. Some people can help financially. Other people can't. I was up there in a church this week. They said that somebody just gave them like $70,000. Somebody gave them $70,000 to buy land with. Now the preacher said, he said, preacher, they had a Christian school. They remodeled their gymnasium completely for their kids to use and for activities and for their, their school and sport. Somebody, some lady gave them $12,000 to, to, uh, uh, to remodel the gymnasium. There ain't no doubt in my mind if there is people that come here to our church every once in a while that could give tremendously to help out stuff like the, the spot for the store, things like that. But here's the way it is. People just sit back and sit back and sit back and say, if somebody else will do it, I'll let them do it. You don't find many people that will just jump up and say, hey, I want, to, I want to do something for God. How long has it been since you, as a church member, just said, I want to do something in my church. I want to do something for the Lord. I want to do something for God. And I prayed this evening that God would touch your heart. Because I can fuss at you for not visiting, and I can fuss at you for not giving, and I fuss at you, and it don't do no good. But if God touches your heart tonight and said, hey, that's you that I'm talking to tonight, then it'll do some good. There's people in here that's got the gift of just help. There's one man in here, and I'm going to call some names now. Now, if I do not call your name, that don't, not, that don't mean that I don't think you're right with God. If I wanted to call everybody's name, 
You're dying to see who's winning the baseball game right now. Some of you. I hate to tell you this, but I was in a church the other night, and the sound man, Dale Franklin, had the World Series on the TV up in the sound room while I was preaching. What are you watching up there? That's just... I, there's a church not too far from here where somebody went down the road and the deacon, they had to start the service. The ball game was already on. And the deacons were out in the parking lot with a portable TV up on the top of the car watching it before they had to go in. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to watch a ball game. We all hope, praise God, Jane and Ted lose. <laughs> you say, who are you for? Whoever's against Jane. <laughs> You don't, want, you don't want Ted Turner to win, people. I'm not even against you like Atlanta, but you don't want Ted Turner. He's one of the most influential people for the devil in America. He's shaping what Americans think. Well, this is one message. I don't know if I'm going to be on the radio or not. But look at here. Look at here. <laughs> You're for Atlanta, bro, ain't you? Oh, okay. I couldn't care less about the ball game. I just don't want the, the traitor to win. Jane and Ted. He's paying for his sin, brother, having to put up with her. That's right. That's right. There's a man in here tonight, and I'm on a name, and he's going he's gonna to be real embarrassed when I'm on name. I'm going to name him, but he's got the gift of heaven. we got a lot of people in here that's got to that. But this brother here, I've seen it happen on at least three or four times. Brother Carmi over here. Brother Carmi over there, and he didn't know I was going to mention him, but I just thought about him this evening. Lord, just, there's been more than one time, and he don't even know. I'm getting ready to say, and Carrie can tell you if this ain't the truth. See, preachers, a preacher don't, we get paid on Sunday night. You get paid on Friday, you're rich over the weekend. We're rich on Monday, you know, I'm broken at the weekend. It's opposite from where you are. We get to go to the bank on Monday when there ain't a big time to stand there. And there's been two or three times just in the past over the years that I had been broke on Sunday morning and nothing to hold And I mean, that don't happen very often. Most of the time it's not. I'm not trying to give you a sad story. My fault, really. And, uh, you know, just mismanaged a little bit through the week. And I told Carrie, I said, honey, we ain't gonna, we aren't, I'm not going to take your girls out. I can't, I can't go home and cook a big meal on Sunday evenings. I can't do it. If one of you don't invite me over, well, I'll take them to go get them some. But don't fuss at me. It's your fault. And, and <laughs> that's right. <laughs> And there's been more times than one that Brother Carmi, on those very days, it never happened when I've got money. Never. But as sure as I'm broke, he'll come over here and shake my hand and he'll say, here you go, go get your family something to eat. And there'll be a $20 bill in my hand. And that's happened more than once. I'm not kidding. And I walked here and said, whoo, glory to God, let's go get some chicken. You know, let's go get some, take it home, need it. Let's go, girl. God supply. That happened one time. Hey, I was out at Wendy's one day and was standing in line to order and didn't have nothing. Carrie said, Daddy, you ain't got no money. I said, don't worry about it. It'll come up. There's a fellow standing there beside me. Walked right in. Laid down about a, uh, I think it was a $100 bill and said, I'm going to buy you supper. Buy you dinner. Now, that don't happen when you got money. Have you ever noticed that? It's always, I believe some people, God just puts it on His heart to do that. And that has happened. I thought about Brother Bruce, how he's got the gift of help. Did you know some people's gift is helping other people find... <laughs> That's right. It really is. Some people's gift is helping you find your gift. This man will help you find your gift. And if you don't have any gifts, he'll let you do something whether you've got a gift or not. That's right. Somebody asked me the other day, they come in the store, they said, I can't believe this. This is beautiful. You're spending a fortune. I said, we ain't hardly spent much at all on this. You know why? Because we've got a man in here that's got the gift of help, Mr. Powell. He has saved us tens of thousands of dollars, folks. You just don't know. Him, Brother Glenn, and Brother Jack Arrowwood back there, and these fellas come, and all these men that come and paint. See, I need no electrician. I can't be a carpenter. I can get him to preach a little bit, and I can do that. He can build. Hey, he built a building. I preach to the people that gets in them. I can't build a building, and I don't know if he'd want to preach next Sunday. I doubt it. Would you, Miss Pat? 
But see, the reason God is him because me and him's birthday is on the same day. <laughs> Coming up in just one week and one day. And did you know that? I didn't know that until the other day. But listen, that brother, he's got the gift of help. He can flat help a church, people. Then we got oodles of people that run around here. Brother Lee Wheeler. All these bus workers. My soul. I get to think about these nursery workers. And, and uh, Miss Jan, how much work she's done in the nursery. And the nursery work. Oh, and they're going to have a meeting tonight, by the way. And listen, we need, we need at least five. Would you say five, sister? Would you say five? At least five ladies who will say, I, you can stay one service a month in the nursery. About all you ladies got that gift. About all of you got the gift of being able to help in the nursery. You don't, it's not fair for just the same ones that have in there. And it's not fair for you to lay out when it's your turn or just desert them because you want to hear a preacher or something like that. You need to exercise your gift. Sis, get in there. I think about, I can't, I can't play piano like Kathy. That's her job. These guys that play guitar, Brother John that leads the singing, everybody uses their gifts. Everybody uses their gifts. And I'm talking about people that ain't getting paid a salary. Like Brother Jay over here that makes him steps, man. And a lot of these guys hit him. Boy, he is a step maker. I couldn't make him steps like that. I couldn't fix all those things. I couldn't fix it plain over there like Mark did. That he, listen, people, if, if you'll be willing to do something, God will use you and use your gift. Now, I'm going to this. I didn't plan on preaching this long, really. The girls that sing. I was over in a camp meeting over in Morristown, Tennessee the other day. Them ladies fix three meals a day and a snack at night. That's four times a day that's feeding me. In just a few minutes, I'm going to be asking our ladies to meet right over here in the choir room for just a short, very short meeting that will be willing to cook during the camp for the camp meeting. You say, well, Brother Danny, I want to enjoy the service this Thanksgiving week and I'm busy and all that. I've been a little bit busy myself, week. It ain't going to kill you. The truth is, do you want to help? Do you want to help? There's a 21-year-old boy and a 17-year-old boy. I met last, or talking about last night. Went out and led somebody to the Lord this week. 21-year-old, a 17-year-old. Let me tell you, all our teenagers in here, raise your hand. All our teenagers in here, raise your hand. There ain't a bit of reason in the world why you teenagers couldn't and shouldn't just come out Saturday morning and go with some of these older people and go visit why don't you do that so much? Now, I know we have a lot that do, but we have some that don't or won't. You need to do something for God. You say, oh, wait well, Lama, if you won't do it now, there's a good chance you're not going to do it when you get in your 20s and in your 30s. I heard about a boy up there this week, still in high school, passed two packs of chick tracks his first week being saved. You hear me? I'm going to say it again. A boy that just got saved passed up two packs of chick tracks at school his first week being saved. We took a young man home last night to him. One of them's name is Jay, one of them is John. Teenage boy, about 17 years old. And they come running out and they want to show me and the preacher something. You know what that young boy done? I'm just talking about using your imagination, doing something for the Lord. My boy come out there and he had this big old pumpkin, a jack-o'-lantern. And he had John 3.16 carved in it. Instead of eyes and teeth. Ain't that a neat idea? I had all kinds of ideas when I seen that. So, man, wouldn't it be nice? Get you a great big pumpkin this week. Oh, empty it out completely and write turn or burn in it and light it up and put it out in your front yard. Hey, Amen. Glory to God. Wouldn't that be a good witness? Take you a great big one. Have all these big pumpkin shows, you know. Get one and write, repent. Put that out in your yard and leave it all week. Every night this week, light it up. Them old trick-or-treaters come out there, repent in that pumpkin. <laughs> Amen. That's a good idea, brother. I never thought of that, did you? These ladies that are making the crafts and stuff for our, for our bookstore, you ain't going to believe. You ain't going to believe. Right over there next door is a place to do your Christmas shopping this year. You ain't going to believe the stuff we're going to have over there that our ladies are making. They're making pillows that are beautiful that say Noel. They're making wreaths for Christmas. They're making ceramic nudity scenes. I mean, nice stuff, brother. All that is is just somebody saying, I want to help. I want to help. Now, I'll tell you what. Since, since, it's, since it's so late, Becky, would it be all right if we just met with the ladies next, next Sunday night? Let's do that. It's getting late. The kids got to go to school tomorrow. And I've done... Got one homesick tonight. And they had to, matter of fact, they took her to the hospital 
Thursday night when I was gone, the fever rushed up 104 and it scared me to death and I thought I was going to have to fly home and they took her to the doctor and he just said she, her fever just went down, didn't even know what it was and she's a little bad. So uh, we'll let you go home tonight since it's so late, but we would like to have just a short meeting with the nursery workers and we need some volunteer nursery workers. We're going to work up here tomorrow night and Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. We can use men, ladies. A bunch of you asked, or some of you asked, when we're going to start cleaning up the store. We're starting. Parking lot's paved, and we'll be cleaning over there, working tomorrow night about 7 o'clock. Tomorrow night, Tuesday night, and then, of course, we'll be here Wednesday night, okay? I'll stop right there. Let's stand. We'll pray. We'll be dismissed. I hope that you'll find whatever gift that you feel like you can use for God. Oh, yeah, get ushers. You need to go through and pick up these. These things, if y'all just pass them down to the end of the aisles right quick, pass these things up. Here's a watch that belongs to somebody. Is that yours, brother? Okay. Um, and just pass those over right quick and we'll get those up and they can go through them this week. We're really going to need some help with you ladies cooking. They're going to try to cook a bunch of stuff that they freeze and so you'll have it done before the camp meeting ever starts. And then just get it out. And we really need some help, you teenage girls. They'll clean up. We're going to feed the visitors. Excuse me, every day at lunch. Now, last year we had people to donate turkeys. And so if you get a turkey at work, some of you get two turkeys at work. Uh, some of you work for the turkey. <laughs> You're thinking. I said, but did you know, if you get two turkeys at work or a turkey you don't, you want to donate it to the camp meeting, we're going to have to have a bunch of them next year. You know? There's a bunch of them, wasn't there? Huh? Eight last year? We'll probably need ten at least, ten or twelve turkeys for Thanksgiving Day. If somebody would like to just buy one and donate, you can't cook, you can afford one maybe. Uh, buy one, let us know, and then we're going to be asking for refreshments and stuff like that. And we're going to feed our visitors one meal a day, just one meal a day, and we're looking forward to it. All right, let's bow our head and pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what we've studied in the Word of God tonight, and I pray it's been a help to somebody. And I ask you, Lord, that you'd bless our visitors tonight. And, Lord, I pray that some of these things that we didn't have time to go into, that the truth will sink in on them. And, Lord, at another time we can go into it better and deeper and, and more thorough. I pray, God, that you'd bless now as we go our separate ways and the work throughout the week. In Jesus' name, amen.